Hi, and welcome to the Fancy Comma YouTube. Today, we're joined by Dr. David Shane Lowry, who is a professor, serves on the faculty at University of Southern Maine. He earned his BS from MIT and both master's and PhD from UNC Chapel Hill, all in anthropology. He's an anthropologist and member, citizen of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. He grew up in the Lumbee community in Robeson County, North Carolina. In 2021 to 2022, he was the distinguished fellow in the Native American Studies at MIT, where he led a new conversation at MIT about the responsibilities of MIT and science and technology education more generally in the theft of American Indian land and the dismantling of American Indian health and community. From 2022 to 2023, he was visiting senior fellow in the School of Social Policy at Brandeis University at USM. David runs the Indigenous Relationships Lab as a place for and commitment to justice and remattering of the American Indian and other indigenous peoples from Maine to Massachusetts to North Carolina. David writes and hosts conversations on Intrust, which is at indigenouspeoplestrust.org. I used to live in Washington, D.C. The, that's where Howard University and HBCU is located. And I was reading one of your posts and it was actually, it turned out that the guy that founded it was a um, person that supported like Indian genocide. So then I was like, right. I actually um, don't know what to think about that. Like, how do you see your work fitting into the greater um, space of like diversity. I also lived in DC for a year. I was a lecturer. That was my first faculty position, which it wasn't a permanent faculty position at American University. When I arrived at American University, I think it was roughly, was that fall of 2012? Um, I had students in my classroom who quite honestly said that they were told that they wouldn't be, that they would be talking about certain topics in a course on a race, which were mostly like black, white, um, immigrant versus citizen sort of conversations. So when I had an entire like two or three weeks focused on the need to uh, what I call rematter American Indian or indigenous people, uh, students sat, sat in there with a bit of like, I, I don't want to call it anger, but there was this kind of visceral reaction as if they weren't supposed to be engaged in conversations that humanize American Indian people. I had faculty who would regularly tell me, you know, I'm surprised that American University could find a native faculty that they would want to recruit here to teach their students. I mean, th that was the gist of what they were saying. Um, and, you know, as a younger scholar, as a person who was like a little younger, you know, I took it as one of those battles that I had to get through, you know, one of the struggles to become a professor, to become a, a scholar. Um, I realized that now around Washington, D.C. was this kind of veneer, right? of sports worship, people who are white, black, Asian, Latino, people from the Middle East, people from all over the world, uh, were very actively in their downtime going to what we call the Redskins. I call it the R word because I think it's akin to the N word, right? The R word games. And, um, you know, these were people not just that had, you know, faculty jobs and government jobs and different types of corporate jobs in DC. A lot of them were involved in setting Indian policy. You know, they worked for the Department of Interior. They did, they worked for the Department of Commerce, for the Department of, of Labor. They had jobs that quite honestly, you know, you wonder if it would have been important for them. Well, I don't, I don't wonder. I know it was important for them to see and to understand and to have relationships with American Indian people. But in their downtime, or I should say in their offices, there were probably photos and helmets and jerseys, you know, that they got at games uh, with the R word emblazoned on it, right? And, and so my question from that time forward, and it's been a question for the last decade, I think I've had, is I know that Native people, for a lot of folks in D.C., were uh, by definition dehumanized, right? But at the same time, um, my goal as an anthropologist became the work of rehumanizing American Indian people and telling them, number one, I, as an American Indian scholar, should be in the room teaching your students. But I should also, and people like me, should also be in positions of influence and power, uh, in positions to sort of create and direct and engineer, if you will, the future. And so it became different conversations. No, no president has allowed for an American Indian, Native American, Indigenous person to be really seriously considered for the Supreme Court of the United States. And quite honestly, we're at a moment where the Supreme Court of the United States is very diverse, right? We have a Latino or one Latina person. Uh, we have a, a black, two black American 
people. Um, other people, white, and I think we currently do have a Jewish Supreme Court justice, justice, but I know in the past we've definitely had Jewish Supreme Court justices. What does it mean that in women and men, what does it mean that we have all of that, arguably that that diversity in the court of the highest um, the highest court in the nation, what some people in history have called the court of the conqueror, but the people in charge of vetting candidates for that court have never really allowed uh, seriously a consideration of indigenous people, American Indian people onto that court. So that's one type of conversation that has evolved with me over the last year is not only do we need to point that out, but what do we do collectively, uh, both socially, politically, educationally, to correct that absence of American Indian indigenous people? I, I as an anthropologist who is American Indian, are doing two jobs. I'm doing, on one hand, very explicit re-education of people who have been purposely miseducated uh, in the United States. These are people who are both young students and they're very old faculty and old people who lead corporations. I educate everybody in various ways, in various contexts. On the other hand is really building up um, scholarship and political kind of a political push, a public political push to get American Indian uh, uh, and more generally indigenous people to be place to be given priority, to be centered in how the business of America, how the business of America works. It's interesting that you mentioned the Supreme Court because um, I was talking to Kelly, who's a sociologist who works with us, and she was telling me about Supreme Court cases that basically decided the Cherokee removal. So mm -hmm. um, it kind of, Supreme Court kind of has a long way to go there. The Supreme Court has a long way to go with diversity. And sometimes I wonder what diversity really means like I think that sometimes like people think you can just add some like diverse looking people and call it a day and that doesn't really address any of the structural problems that truly exist that keep people out of stuff. Do, how do you go about having these conversations because it, especially after the death of George Floyd there's a lot of talk about race like where does your work fit in there and like is there a constructive way to do this without like calling everyone racist or like how do you in what ways do you have you found meaningful progress after george floyd was killed by police a lot of the activism a lot of the um uh the political sort of uprise after his death was preceded by was set up by uh, decades ago the american indian movement in minneapolis the area where George Floyd uh, was killed was one of was within that kind of space, that kind of zone, if you will, of major American Indian activism and political pushing. Uh, again, decades before, fifth, what was that? Basically, fifty years, sixty years before um, we ever heard the name George Floyd. Um, and the aftermath of his being killed, a lot of the protest, ironically, went through the, a particular set of streets or neighborhoods where American Indian people um, had businesses, had community centers, were uh, working out sort of their place in contemporary 2020 society, right? Uh, they were attempting to, in various ways, take the demattered or the uh, dehumanized American Indian communities in America, and, and in particular in Minneapolis, pull them into a position where they could be economically stable, where their communities could be taken care of and healed in new ways. Uh, but ironically, in the aftermath of his death, a lot of the people who protested his death actually did damage to their businesses and their communities. Zo zoom out, right? There was no conversation about how AIM, the American Indian Movement, and the Red Power Movement, and different types of Native political activism preceded the protest of 2020. And there were a lot of American Indian people who, across the nation, were looking around saying, wait a minute, like, why is it that when, in this case, a Black man dies, it's becoming news, extra kind of uh, um, explosive news across the United States that demands change? When we have actively been calling for people to identify the fact that police across the United States purposely target our men and women and children um, to the point where there were a series of articles. One was by, I believe, the public news station in Minnesota or Wisconsin. I'm not sure. And this journalist very keenly, and she was African-American, black journalist. She said that basically after George Floyd's death, there was this assumption 
that per capita black people died more often from police violence than any other ethnic racial group. She said, in fact, it's not the case. American Indian, Native American people actually die more often from police violence. So this actually gets into what became for me a critique of journalism. Um, American Indian people, I get, I think across, there's 600 plus, I think it's 600, like 15, 623, something like that, American Indian nations that make up the United States. These are nations. These are, they have governments, they have constitutions, they have flags. I mean, the United States is full of American Indian peoples, nation groups. A lot of people don't recognize that. But in that moment, I'm sitting here and a lot of Native American, American Indian people are sitting here and saying, yeah, like, how is it that in the midst of all of this? So um, people were beginning to say, okay, not only are we missing from these news stories, but when we begin to kind of pick apart data to show, hey, who gets killed by police, who is affected most by negligence in healthcare, what we found out was that American Indian people, Native American people, um, are left out of data. So in regards to police violence, in regards to healthcare outcomes in hospitals, in regards to public health in certain disease states, we are consistently left out of data. Why is that? One is because a lot of our people um, are just purposely dismissed in the context of demography and other types of data collection. The other part is, as this emerging kind of technological data collection mechanism is being created, as this kind of technology is being kind of created and, and uh, revealed, these technologies don't know how to see us, categorize us, pull us into data, because they're taught by the people who program them who are not us that we don't exist anymore. And you may say, well, how does that happen? It happens in various ways. People from the moment they step out of their mother's womb are not taught about us. People, as they go through various educational apparatuses, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, blah, 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 in corporations and governments, they're not, they're taught that we just simply don't exist. Technology is situated and developed in such a way that it doesn't want to see indigeneity. It doesn't want to talk about, to consider, to, to, to capture, if you will. Um, this actually brings up a lot of points, which I won't get into. One of the lectures that I've done recently, and it was at my time at MIT, was on technology bias and, and uh, what I called artificial indigeneity. And I think it was the organization NIST, which talks about like data recognition and face recognition and things like that. They actually pointed out that relative to any other group, American and Indian Native American people are more misrecognized by facial recognition kind of software. Uh, and this was a few years ago than any other ethnic racial group. Again, I can't answer the question about why that happens, but I will point out that it is very important that it happens. The Native American Journal Journalists Association, which I tweeted them every once in a while, right? Um, they've had an outright wrestling match, a fight, an ongoing war, if you will, and I'll use that language, with the New York Times. They actually got to the point where they d do not, I think, currently allow the New York Times to visit their annual conference. And these are journalists in Canada and the United States who are part of the same organization of journalists who are American Indian, Native American, or Indigenous. And the point that they were making in keeping the New York Times out is that over years, on a regular basis, the New York Times has purposely situated American Indian, Native American people and other indigenous peoples like in Canada as people who are not at the same level of humanity as other people. Uh, they've used blatant lang language that blatantly dehumanizes and makes us look childish, that makes us look as if we um, are not able to take care of ourselves, that makes us into children. Um, there's a sense of paternalism at the New York Times. Now, I've reached out to various editors over social media. For the most part, I've written a couple emails. Washington Post, uh, New York Times, and I've asked them one simple question. Why is it that you do not have a journalist who is American Indian, Native American, who can focus with with lots of resources, right? Focus just on the business of Native America. And to use the point of decolonization, I know you said you, you may not use it that much, on the work of removing the conditions and kind of breaking down the conditions of colonization so that we can enter an era where American Indian, Native American people and indigenous peoples across the North American continent are humanized, are, are brought into a new sense of humanity, um, are uh, valued, are mattered. And I use this term often, remattering. 
there's been a demattering over centuries of our people across all these 600 plus American Indian nations in the United States. We need a new era of remattering our people. Now, after the George Floyd thing, there are all commercials are more diverse, but I feel like it's sort of that doesn't really solve the problem. So we're both MIT grads. You have done a lot of work about creating a course at MIT called Indigenous MIT, where you talked about indigen the indigenous experience of MIT or like indigenous people at MIT. Tell us about that. And also making science more indigenous, amenable to indigenous values, making MIT more reflective of its indigenous people that are there, um, maybe trying to move past some of the, the history that's negative um, and um, things like ending burnout. Like what are all your thoughts on I guess all of those issues. I'll start with your earlier question and move into this one. You brought up earlier the conditions of diversity and like if you put people in place, does it truly fix the history of racism and more generally colonialism in the United States? A lot of what my work tends to do is focus in on this new era of DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion. I oftentimes point out that you know, black DEI experts say, well, we're only like 10 or 15% of DEI leaders, right? And they kind of bemoan that and say, ah, oh, you know, we should have more diversity in DEI leaders. I'll look at them and say, well, how many American Indian, Native American and indigenous uh, diversity leaders do you know? And they'll say, uh, well, and I'm like, pretty much none. I know like two. And, and Latino, black, white, I know dozens of each of people from each of those racial ethnic groups who are DI leaders. And so what I point out to people is not only are we as American Indian people not able to captain or lead uh, diversity, equity, inclusion work, there's a reason why. And so historically, it's been white supremacy that has been accused and has been the culprit in making various communities that are not white into subhuman categories, right? This is actually part and parcel of a decades decades long uh, DEI sort of economy that has progressively not allowed American Indian indigenous people to sort of say what DEI should be. There's a veneer that we are morally correcting ourselves as a society towards justice, and quite honestly, we're not. Now, if you bring that back to Boston, right, um, the origins of the Atlanta Braves, which continue to use American Indians as a mascot through the context of a tomahawk chopping, fake war whooping at games, right? And, and fake Indian chanting. They began in Boston and people in Boston during the time, early days of MIT, when MIT was in the business of helping engineer, right? The theft of Indian land. And that's a long conversation and I've written a lot of stuff about it. Um, the Boston Braves began to be a team here in Boston. Eventually they moved, I think, to Milwaukee and I think eventually to Atlanta. But Boston, quite honestly, is the birthplace for engineering, scientific, political and sport dehumanization and, and sort of colonization of American Indian peoples and nations. So I feel like in my work, especially as I came to MIT, it was increasingly important to not allow people to just talk about science and engineering, to just talk about politics, to just talk about healthcare, to just talk about sport. You have to continually talk about all of them because in every facet of how a person lives their everyday lives, when they wake up, go to their job, when they eat lunch, from which is based on food from stolen any land, if I can say that, when they're now getting off of work and going to a game at a local stadium, all of those aspects of their lives are a process as are a kind of an economy, if you will, of enjoying uh, states of stolen land, dehumanization of American Indian people. And general, generally, as we suggested earlier, um, uh, a disappearance of American Indian, Native American people from consciousness, right? Um, so when I came to MIT um, in, two, in 2021, I had all of this on my mind, right? And I noticed that there was this emerging at MIT, and it, it was old, right? An old program or conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion that did not include American Indian people. And actually, there's a famous um, urban studies planning uh, faculty member. His name is Clarence Williams. He wrote a book called Technology and the Dream. And I was at MIT as an undergrad starting in 99 and I took time off and I eventually, fi eventually finished in late 2006 with my undergrad. During that time, he was busy both preparing for this book 
and writing it. And I remember he used to invite students in to be interviewed. Most of them were black. Um, some of them were Latino and none of them were American Indian. And I used to ask questions back then. Why can't his name is Clarence Williams? Why can't I have an interview with Clarence Williams? Cause I knew what he was doing. And eventually, as I, as we saw, as I saw, as we saw the book became a story of race at MIT, which only focused 99% of its efforts, right? were on black life at MIT. Now, my question to everybody at MIT during my year there was why has there been so much emphasis on the relationship between white people and black people at MIT? When quite honestly, MIT began as the business starting with Francis Walker, the third president of MIT started with the business of making sure that American Indian native American people didn't have their land were pushed out of the way um, of these processes of like unfolding engineering into the American landscape and would never really be, the, the plan of MIT was that American Indian Native American people would never be in a position to be leading scholarly experts at M MIT, in, at the, um, the United States and the world's leading engineering institution. And those are questions that quite honestly, I wanted other people to begin answering. And I felt like at that moment, People in higher administration at MIT, people who are faculty, they most thought it was a curious kind of funny conversation, something that piqued their interest, right? But they weren't willing to upend and kind of deal with their comfort at MIT to begin to answer those questions and to begin to, more importantly, correct the absences of American Indian Native American people at MIT. So, you know, to answer your question about kind of overlapping at MIT and sort of being there, right? MIT, quite honestly, is a funny place because of how important it has been historically and it is currently in dictating trends in both how humans relate, right, which MIT centers human relationship around the idea that everything is engineered, that everything is a, a commodity. If you take economics courses at MIT, everything is a commodity. If you look at indigenous American Indian people, how do we generally view the world? Yeah, we might buy and sell and, you know, create trade around certain products. But we have this idea that our air and our water cannot be sold. It cannot be commodified and commoditized. That is against very old decades, centuries old, if you will, uh, logic within our communities. However, if you go to MIT or any other tech sort of educational space, you're pretty much taught that even if you're trying to you know, save the climate, ultimately everything has a price. Look at carbon credits, for example. Everything has a price. Uh, we as indigenous people across the world, I believe there's a general conversation, but in particular in the United States, amongst hundreds of nations, right, tribal nations, we're attempting to have a conversation, a new conversation about how scientific logic has to be returned and turned back into uh, a commitment to one reversing states of colonial occupation of stolen Indian land, so giving land back, but then two taking a, American Indian indigenous knowledge and putting it at the center. Of, um, uh, of of this new techno kind of scientific world that we live in. That is actually the kind of, I guess, the outline of the book that I'm working on now with MIT Press. It's my second book. The first one is about the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. The second book is called um, Indigenous MIT, Why We Must Save Science and Technology from American Genocide. MIT has this kind of attitude and atmosphere that like, everything for science like we'll literally sacrifice our whole life people put off having children to try to get a tenure track job and then they don't and then like everyone's lives are you know how many stories have i heard about like grad students being in grad school for 10 years and leaving with nothing to show for it all to advance like science but it's more like it's kind of i feel like if um mit was less a place that crushes your soul and more of a place to actually kind of is like a little bit better about burnout. Like, um, I think we all know people that like committed suicide at MIT just cause it's so, it's very hard there. And it's like, if we really like um, valued people more in this, like, and kind of focused on the social science aspects then maybe like kind of adopting indigenous values, like not burning out. Cause that's like a really huge problem for all students there. So um, it's really interesting, but the president of MIT, what was his name? Um, the first fat William Barton Rogers. Rogers I read yeah. he was a slave owner. So it's like, it's mm -hmm. two, there's like layers of racism. So like, obviously that's really bad. And then the whole thing about the guy that obviously the government, the U S government like promoted the removal of native Americans. So like anyone that worked in the government would, I mean, they also like 
has supported slavery for a while. So it's like, how do you really disentangle these two things? Because it's like, we have like, we have all this great technology, but it kind of has like a, a cost. Yeah. And I always talk about the cost of AI and new technologies and like, what exactly are we willing to hide or whatever, or not talk about and keep doing in some ways to have this like great technology. And can we have more ethical technology? Like if our, if we were, if MIT had less problems with like diversity or whatever problems it had, would that be reflected in the technology itself? And do you have any insights on this as an anthropologist? I'll begin that response or my response to that with a article that I recently finished is for a journal that is kind of central to our discipline. It's called General Anthropology. And it's called Native Lives Matter, and it's about, the subtitle is something to the effect of uh, dealing with technological settling. And I start the article with watching the movie The Black Panther, the second one, where you have basically this really interesting interaction between the white police and FBI and sort of this educational kind of police infrastructure in Cambridge, right? Because the movie actually takes place at MIT. And then you have... uh, uh, one student who is being recruited eventually by the people from Wakanda, which we're assuming is on the in Africa. And so you have this interaction. She's working ar- arguably for a white faculty member to engineer all kinds of really interesting, fancy stuff. Now, take that setting and ask yourself, where are the American Indian Native American people? OK. Oh, shoot. Out from the water, from the depths of the whales and the, the, the sea urchins and all kinds of stuff comes the indigenous people and they just pop out of the water. Right. <laughs> and so this in the article become, becomes a series of conversations. Right. One, there's an interesting scene when the people from Wakanda are coming to get and I forget the names of the characters when they're coming to get this really prized black student at MIT. They're sitting standing in front of their car. Well, where is the car at? Literally on campus, like as it exists today. It literally is in front of the new American Indian Indigenous student space at MIT, like the new native space, right? And I'm thinking to myself, only I would know that, or a few people would know that if they knew the area. But I think symbolically, that's really, really important. When you begin to like look at the other parts of the movie and how they unfold, there's an idea, there's, there is an idea that on the surface where people live, where real people live, right? Black and white people do business. They do, they engineer, they design stuff, right? In Wakanda, there's a fancy techno lab. At MIT, there's fancy techno labs, right? Where are the indigenous people at? They're outside of these fancy techno labs. They're down underneath the water. And that is a symbol of, that is a kind of reference to a Disney sort of Marvel universe that situates American Indian and more generally indigenous people as somehow outside the normal conversation, okay? And so I tell that story leading into a conversation about basically how MIT was constructed and science and technology is constructed around the disappearance of American Indian and other indigenous people. But then I began to kind of toy with this idea of what would it mean for there to be a world where indigenous people more generally, but American Indian and Native American people more specifically are allowed to exist in this world where these difficult conversations about the ethics of engineering and scientific techno creation, biological sort of experimentation, a world where we as Native people are allowed to be there dictating and developing policy within that work. That is not the MIT that exists today. That is not the techno science world that exists. They corporations know nothing about us. Best Buy contacted me a couple, what, a year ago and said, yeah, we want to do an interview with you, blah, blah, blah. That never turned into anything. I've had various people from various corporations kind of ping the idea. Maybe we can have a conversation that would introduce these ideas to our corporation. At the end of the day, that is not in line with their business sensibilities. And until that changes, until these policies on the surface, until these kind of uh, this kind of economy of technological innovation and, and business changes on the surface, at, at, until Native people are not subsumed and kept within this underwater, out of the way, uh, both physical and psychological kind of space that we are kept in, until that is changed. Um, the humanity of science and technology isn't going to be evident. Um, and yes, suicides at MIT, to your point, have not 
stopped. Um, MIT has gone out of its way to bring in counselors and psychologists and people to kind of create new student life at MIT. And I've told them, I said it during my 21, 22 year. I've said it as an alumni in my years leaving MIT. I said it as a student at, or in my years after leaving MIT. I said it as a student since 1999. Unless you see and understand that students understand, even if they don't know how to articulate it, they understand that they are living in a kind of MIT sort of bubble infrastructure kind of apparatus that profits from not giving, as we say in the South, two hoots about humans, doesn't care, doesn't have relationships with the most vulnerable humans, in this case, indigenous peoples, American Indian and native indigenous peoples. Unless we understand that, unless we understand that MIT and the science technology world is like that, until we get to the core of that, right? And that's what my second book is about, trying to get to the core of that. Um, we're going to continue to have and kind of operate within a scientific and techno world uh, that is damaging, that does more harm than good, if not overwhelming harm and, and very little good. Um, and, and, and kind of a techno science world that is a, this dystopian. And, and we hate to kind of jump into dystopian sort of futures where the world is run by AI and there's a few oligarchs at the top, technocrats, if you will, that control how people think and live, whatever. But, but how native people, are, if we're honest about how native and indigenous people are being treated right now in the techno science world and how that's creating an unsafe environment, right, for everybody, that are not just native indigenous people, um, until we acknowledge that, like if we do acknowledge that, that is the beginning of um, repairing and humanizing and, and bringing a new sense of life into the science and tech space. Um, can I give a quick example? One example. Um, I don't have it on. Shoot. Um, my brass rat. Do you have your brass rat? I don't know if you do. Okay, there you go. The brass rat, it has a beaver. Okay. One quick story, and this is something that I've learned in depth oh, since I've been in Maine. I've seen a few maps at what we call the Osher Map Library up in um, uh, the University of Southern Maine. Um, the beaver, historically, is treated by American Indian and Indigenous people as a relative. They do engineering work within the context of nature that is helpful, that is well, that is good, right? It needs to be done. Um, what happens is once people begin to map the United States, beginning in the early 1700s, the beaver does two things. It becomes a symbol of being in the way of progress. But then also the people that are creating these maps begin to use the beaver as a representative of American sort of ingenuity and ability to engineer the United States and to say at the same time that it's not harmful, right? MIT picked that up years down the road and this, the grat, the clap, the, uh, what we call the brass rat becomes this thing that we wear on our finger to remind us all as MIT graduates that we are imbued with a sense of moral, uh, how shall we say it, innocence when we are doing our engineering work. If we go through course 10, which is chemical engineering at MIT, we have no responsibility for in any way understanding where the products of a, a chemical engineering sort of factory sort of process go. We have, I think more specifically, no responsibility to understanding when the factory or corporation that we're working on is on stolen indigenous land. No responsibility. Rather, we in this bubble called MIT engineer, create, do work that is, uh, that is innocent by definition because it's innocence is based in the idea that what we are doing as engineers is needed and it's needed to preserve us and keep us and give us a helpful, I mean, a, um, a happy and effectively effective life it, to, to provide some sense of, of structure to our lives, if you will. Um, and I think that use of the beaver as a symbol and, and the kind of the disregard for indigenous storytelling that it kind of points to um, is quite dangerous. Um, I've critiqued MIT about it over the years. I really do critique them now. Um, we have to not place ourselves as a science and tech community in this kind of Disney-esque fantasy space where we create these folklore, not, I won't use the term folklore, these, these myth, mythological stories about what science and technology does. And we're, we're helping to propel those types of mythological stories through these kind of really interesting cartoonish 
um, uh, almost childlike caricature-esque storytelling, uh, source of storytelling, make students who come to MIT and through similar kind of science and engineering institutions, make this, them feel that what they're doing is both worthwhile and ultimately will, will do good in the world. The ultimate point of all of my work, of, of the conversations I have, is that unless you focus on primarily and, and preliminarily indigenous ways of knowing and seeing both in terms of correcting colonialism and centering indigenous knowledge, science and tech will, will continue to be um, harmful. So I'm just wondering, so on your social media, you post a lot about like sports mascots, like um, mm -hmm. I watch a lot of sports, but sometimes I can't watch a lot of sports because there is a lot of racism in there. And um, and then you post a lot about like racism in things that we think are not racist, like racism in HBCUs. I'm just wondering, because this is such a, it's like, it's hard to talk about. I, mm -hmm. I feel like if I was doing that, it would, I would, I mean, it's bad to be racist. It's bad to, but it's like, do you have conversations with people at HBCUs and what are those conversations like? Are they like productive or do you think people are receptive to this? Like, especially minorities, like to yeah. making diverse right. decolonization, decolonization, more decolonized. Um, you brought up BC and, and, and O Howard. So O Howard started um, Howard university and, um, and if anybody who's listening to this knows people at Howard that would invite me in for an official like structured lecture on this, I would be appreciative uh, of that opportunity. Oh, Howard, um, he had dual identities. On one hand, he was sort of a leader of uh, the creation of educational opportunities for black peoples after the Civil War, after the ending of slavery in the United States. On the other hand, his co-job, right, the job that was going on sort of at the same time, was leading was leading a charge that against American Indian na nations across the Western United States, in particular the Ness Pierce. And um, he, I make an argument that a lot of his clout, a lot of his, um, the resources that were given to him to really start and, and pick up and build what became Howard University came from his ability or his willingness to do the the business of genocide across the United States against American Indians. Let's start with your question. Have I talked to scholars? The the scholars, most of whom are black at these HBCUs, HBCUs do not want to talk about it. They don't want to. There's this idea that their focus is on, for the most part, black community and black studies. And to critique O.O. Howard and to critique and enter into this conversation about Howard University as birthed in genocide is something that is like it really turns the civil rights kind of social justice conversation in America on its head. It's not that I'm saying, oh, Howard University, you're racist. I'm very specifically saying Howard University, through its founder, was rooted and is based in and was funded by genocide. I'm not putting racist, uh, the term racist to that. I'm saying we need to deal with the origins of this particular university. Now, if you get into other HBCUs, the HBCUs that were founded by the Moral Act of 1890, they all were funded by the same uh, stealing of land that was the basis of the Moral Act of 1862. And there's a great article called Land Grab You, which you all should go read. Um, but you have other HBCUs down south that historically have had native mascots. One of them that currently still has a native mascot called the Braves is, I believe, it's called Alcorn State, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's the name of the college. And again, I very openly, social media, I've sent a couple emails to people, I've very openly asked for a reconsideration and a dismissal of that name, the Braves, as the mascot or as the team name for um, Alcorn State. Again, do people want to talk about this? I don't think it is in their business interest to talk about this. But my point as an anthropologist is this can't be dollars and cents. Yes, genocidal has always genocide has always been profitable. That is what the United States is based in. But we must take a moral ethical stand, if you will, against conversations being just about what makes sense financially. Um, which quite honestly, giving Indian land back is not financially uh, on the surface is not financially um, enhancing for various people around the United States who are not indigenous. But we as native people are saying, and David Schreier, who's an anthropologist, wrote a good article, I think, in Atlantic about why we should return um, national parks to tribes. He makes the case. He's like, yeah, technically, government just owns the parks. You know, it is what it is. It's financially 
okay. But when we're entering into this age, right, whether we call it climate change or environmental destruction or whatever it is that we're, we're labeling this new age of, there's a lot of stuff going on planetarily. It is time to move stuff, move actual land and deeds and ownership into the hands of American Indian people uh, so that we as humanity at large can begin to try to fix, repair, <laughs> save ourselves, if you will, uh, from immense destruction uh, that is already happening across the, across the world. It's really hard. You mentioned the mascots. Um, I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan, and she just started dating Travis Kelsey, who's on yeah. the Chiefs. And um, I mean, they're another one of those teams that's named after Native American places. Um, there's a lot of them. Like, it's hard to not like it's it's almost like there's I mean, they're slowly getting changed. I think like the, the Cleveland changed their name to the Guardians, the baseball team. But it's like the R word became the commanders, though. I still don't like them because they are terrible. They were terrible when I lived in Washington. I was a Patriots mm -hmm. fan. Um, mm -hmm. But like um, there it's um, it's like a really hard conversation because remember, it was so difficult to get people just to think about African-American issues and that level of colonialism. And then adding this, I feel like um, maybe it will be easier because we're already having those conversations. But I just, when I think of how hard it was, it must've been really hard to establish the first HBCU. And then it's good to, but it's like, um, it's not complete conversation without considering like, obviously Indian Native American genocide. At this, at this last Super Bowl, right? Um, there was a major campaign by the American Indian Center of Kansas City, where they stood outside the stadium, I, whatever, I think it was in Phoenix, and were protesting the use of Chief's name as a mascot, right? That like that was a thing. They were saying it dehumanizes us. We're, we, we're not seen because the mascot is a representation of Native America. We need to be present fully as humans. You would never use you know black people, Latino people, Asian people as mascots. Why are we and our, our, our cultures, if you will, use as mascots with beating drums and tomahawk chops and whatever. It's really sad. Like, I can't watch it. Like, I don't, I lived in, I spent some time in Kansas City, but I can't be a Chiefs right. fan because I, I hate looking at that every time because it's so but, culturally insensitive. But let me set up this juxtaposition. Inside the stadium, right, there was a famous black singer. Again, I, I was lecturing on this other day. I don't remember her name, but she was in a red dress, which is important when you think about the fact that a red dress. Was it Rihanna? No, if she's an older, she's an older singer, um, but she was singing the black national anthem. You can Google it. She was singing the black national anthem in a red dress. This is important because the red dress for American Indian, Native American Indigenous people now represents this fight to to understand missing and murdered Indigenous women. So if you see the red dress campaign, it's about MMIW or hashtag MMIW. We need to focus on that. You know, Native women across the United States and across Canada are going missing, right? So as she's singing the Black National Anthem, right, in front of teams dressed in the Chiefs mascot, she's talking about the liberty and the humanity of black people in the United States, juxtaposed to white people, arguably, but within the context of this team here surrounding her that was dressed in the dehumanization of American Indians. Outside the stadium, not, in, not inside, outside the stadium, begging for media attention, which they really didn't get, were American Indian people who were like, oh my God. Like, we can understand that you all want to talk about this and that. I see your frustration because every day I'm like, we're all like, oh, my gosh, I have to be way better about structural racism. But um, as if I were a Native American indigenous person in the, living in the U.S., I would kind of probably be maddened or maybe kind of like it. It doesn't the juxtaposition is very striking. It's just it's not a good juxtaposition, but it's like um, it's hard to decolonize something that that has already that already was a product of decolonization but it's like um i mean like i look forward to day when we don't have like all these native american ma like racist mascots because i want to sit down and like watch a football game without everyone just like turning like being racist because it sucks so you brought the idea of decolonization of decolonization if you're calling the civil rights movement which led to the black national anthem and the celebration of black peoples in the stadium with the chief's mascot decolonization i would say that is not decolonization um i say that for uh, within the context if you look back at like martin luther king and his high, i have a dream speech read it I, anybody who's listening to this read the speech but he's like let freedom ring from 
Iowa, from Mississippi, the Mobile Hills of Mississippi. He says all kinds of stuff like that. My question is, and was when I was a child, and I used to ask my mom this, I read the speech in school. I heard it, right? Why didn't Martha Luther King Jr. talk about freedom ringing from the reservations of North Dakota or the reservations of Oklahoma? Well, in Oklahoma, a lot of natives say they don't live on reservations, but the reservations of very in various states in the United States, Florida, the Seminole, the Miccosukee. Why didn't he talk about freedom ringing from the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, from you know the various tribes, Pueblo, the Pueblos in New Mexico? I think the reason is, I mean, there is re- the reason is that he was doing an impossible task. Like the FBI was calling him every day, telling him to just stop being alive because. The, U- the U- U.S. doesn't have a good history, and I don't know to, I mean, I'm assu- I, it's, it's hard for me to, like, think about history, and sometimes I just don't think about it, honestly, because, like, colonial, like colonialism on top of colonialism on top of colonialism, then if you think about racism against immigrants, like, there's no culture or person on the, in the U.S. that has never faced racism. I mean, I don't know, maybe if you tried to measure racism, maybe there, you could quantify it, but um, it's, it it it's it's shocking that the the effect what mm-hmm. reading your work after like following you on social media and reading some of your blogs and stuff i've kind of come to appreciate that this the level of colonialism that has has happened and it's 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 a lot of colonialism and um i guess the one way forward for everyone is to at least know about it and acknowledge it because I really do feel that understanding racism, genocide, all the those, those different things, just even knowing about them makes you a more informed, more literate member of society. And like, I think that goes a long way. My last question for you is, what are some ways that indigenous issues, some of these issues can be tackled through science communication? Like you're an MIT graduate, you have a BS in anthropology, and I was just doing another YouTube talking about mm-hmm all the science classes you have to take to get a, um, like my friend has an English degree from MIT and he has a BS in English, but like, Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on tackling these issues through science communication, maybe through education? Are you doing any of this in Maine at the IRL, Indigenous Relationships Lab? I actually want to shout out um, Darren Ranko and, um, oh gosh, She's going to be mad that I forgot her name. I don't know her that well. She's a faculty member at in the anthro department at, at UMass Amherst. But we can they, link everyone in the description box. Yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. do that later. There's a big. There's a there was a big NSF um, grant that was announced recently that is about bringing indigenous knowledge back into the center of science. So it's between University of Maine, University of Massachusetts Amherst, and several other colleges, and I think even an institution in England. But um. There's emerging conversation. I had it in my team 21, 22. They're having it in this NSF work. I'm doing it in my book, Indigenous MIT. We're having to do two things in science education. You have to first teach people that American Indian people, Native American people still exist, right? Which is constant foundational work because it's breaking up and kind of dismantling the conversation, the deep conversation that you're referencing, that you're referencing earlier. But it's really getting people to understand that science and tech um, is better, is, is, is more applicable, is safer, is, um, gosh, more robust, if you will, if indigenous ways of knowing and seeing, right, that have been consistently hidden over centuries, if indigenous ways of knowing and seeing are, are integrated and reintegrated and reappropriated or re, not appropriated, resituated and centered in science education. Yes, uh, at IRL, which is Indigenous Re- Re- Relationships Lab that I'm starting at University of Southern Maine, I'm doing that type of work. Uh, which isn't just about, hey, how do we do biology? How do we do chemistry? How do we do like, what are the basic sciences? It's really seeing like at MIT, right? How sciences and, and technology, right? Are English and anthropology and political science. Really when you're doing the work of political activism, when you're doing the work of political relationship building, uh, like in Maine with the governor of Maine who is actively opposing Wabanaki Confederacy's uh, sovereignty. Uh, there's several tribes that make up the Wabanaki Confederacy, and she's being given permission by the U.S. Congress to completely stand in the way of their ability to live out their sovereignty. So when we are in IRL at University of Southern Maine are reaching out to her and her staff eventually and saying, hey, how do we begin to have conversations with you, between you and students and community members at University of Southern Maine? That's not just about how do we you know, do agriculture? How 
how do we do planting? How do we do laboratory work? It really is this robust bringing together of disciplines to begin to redesign and reorient, uh, if you will, how knowledge is both taught and learned in Maine, in Massachusetts, in North Carolina, where I'm from and doing my work, and across the United States. Um, I think, and I've said this to various faculty and people who work in and around MIT around science communication, I know some of them. Um, I've met their students as journalists. There is a big hole, a big gap in science communication education and science communication itself that needs to be filled with and, and and within which a certain sense of privilege needs to be given to Native American, American Indian, Indigenous ways of knowing and seeing. So um, I know that's a lot to talk about, but I want to kind of end with that because um, there's really no cor correcting or making science communication better or really living out truly good science communication unless uh, we uh, do the work more generally that I've called for uh, in this conversation and before. Yeah, this has been a great conversation because um, I really I, I read all your stuff that you writing sometimes on LinkedIn because I'm really interested in this subject as as someone that lives in Oklahoma and we've I know a lot of indigenous people. Um, there are a lot of Native Americans in Oklahoma, um, like not even living in reservations, just like because there are tribal license plates, there's, they're everywhere. But um, that's why I I feel like I'm attuned to this discussion I, and I really care about diversity because. Um, I, I think that, that 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 people try to be diverse, try to be inclusive, but I think that sometimes they actually are not really inclusive. Like how much are these, I really am interested to know how much are the efforts that we've made to increase diversity? Like have they actually worked? Do they actually they make places more inclusive? Because when you don't have diversity in, in organizations, that actually isn't, I mean, like it's a problem, but it also means that the output of the organization is also like, worse because the people there there's like gatekeeping and all this stuff and it leads to like like for example i've written about game video game developers and when the video game developers are just all white people they come break these mm -hmm. like really boring i mean like i love video games all kinds of video games but like if you if there's a diversity of video game developers the video game is more like you can play as like different characters like you can play if you're black you have a black developer like maybe they'll have an idea to like make you playable black player or like indigenous player. I'm not sure about the diversity on that level. Um, and I agree that that um, Native Americans often are overlooked in some of these studies or people, um, especially like a, you've called out a number of these studies that look at diversity and they look at only African Americans. Um, I just attended a session on law and the courts and they did a study looking at um, the justice system and they they looked at um, this there's a test called the Daubert test and it's used to admit science into the courts like for expert testimony and so they looked at um, African Americans and the effect of the Daubert test on them and so I asked a question because I've been reading your social media and I was like do you think this this effect is um, just for African Americans do you think it generalizes to all um, minorities, races, and they answered my question. Actually, they thought that it would generalize, but um, I think that it's difficult to, sometimes it's difficult to get like that sample size for your study, but other times you have it and you don't report it because you don't think of it. This gets into demography, back into a conversation about demography. Um, when Joe Biden, President Biden gave his State of the Union address, I think this past year or earlier this year, whenever it was, he actually used a term called uh, people of color. I think he used the term people of color. Then he started talking about, quote unquote, brown people. <laughs> and so, again, on Twitter, my response was, what are brown people? It's not a, that's not a demographic sort of census category. And also, more generally, what are people of color? Uh, even though like MLK used the term people of color, other people who are scholars have used the term people of color. We, we, we're in an interesting um, situation where those ambig that, that purposeful ambiguity of language within which we can't see American Indian, Native American, Indigenous people, right, is slowly becoming, it's a text, right? Those are textual realities. They're gathered into Google. You know, like if I'm looking up what was talked about in 2023, guess what's going to happen? I'll see that Joe Biden called people brown people. And I'll be like, oh, shoot, brown people was a category back then. And, and I'm sitting here in 2023 saying, no, it's not. <laughs> but that's being caught up in this kind of like metaverse 
that will then be progressively in various ways through education and coding and so on be c captured in engineering of games and coding of different kind of worlds that we live in digitally and we must be very careful and this is where science communication comes in within science communication there must be a really profound and purposeful critique of how we talk and there needs to be a precision within which we talk about the histories of what this colonization, for example, means and who exists today. One of my students at Maine says, Southern Maine says, I'm going to start using my tribal name. And so we started debating that. And yeah, I advocate for that. I'm like, but know when to use like Wabanaki, which is like the Confederacy name. Know when to use American Indian, Native American. Then more generally, learn when to use indigenous. And we as Native people are having to constantly work through all those names, those levels of being identified, right? But why are we doing that? Because we understand that both politically, socially, and increasingly in this techno kind of even healthcare world, our identities are being lost because people don't know how to talk about us. Our own president, Joe Biden, doesn't know even how to reference us. He says brown and people of color. That's not how we should be referenced. That's not, we shouldn't assume that we're included as Native American, American Indian people in that category. This is a really, really good conversation. And I'm glad you, having read what I'm writing, are asking these questions because I think they're very, very important, timely, and, and powerful questions. Thank you. Um, it's been a Pleasure and honor to have you on our YouTube 